As far as theming goes, Disney's Animal Kingdom is generally considered to be Disney's best park in the United States. It's not that the other parks are lacking in theming, but in the era of Bob Iger and Bob Chapek compromising the overall thematic integrity of the parks for a quick buck, Animal Kingdom has remained largely unchanged, other than the addition of Pandora, the world of Avatar. We're definitely seeing IP creep in here and there, but I think we should try to understand what makes Animal Kingdom so great, and why its lead designer, Joe Rohde, is so important in preserving the thematic integrity of the park. Joe Rohde reaches the height of some of Disney's greatest Imagineers, and with the announcement of his retirement on November 23rd, 2020, I think it's time we take a look at his legacy within the company, and how it relates to the amazing park that is Disney's Animal Kingdom. I'm not one of these people that imagined through my life that I would always work for Disney. I grew up around movies and sets because of my dad, but I grew up here in Hawaii, so I never went to Disneyland or anything like that until I was like 12 years old when we moved to California. So my appreciation for Disneyland was already modeled by an appreciation of the fact that it was scenic art when I went to Disneyland. Um, but really, I imagined I would do something else. I was sort of recruited uh, during that Epcot age to come in and work on models. One of the executives had seen some of my set design work. Said, Young man, you should work for Walt Disney Imagineering. And I was like, why in the world would they ever hire me? I, you know, I have long hair, I look like a hippie, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they did, they did. Uh, so I started working in the model shop and it took me a while to find my niche uh, at Imagineering. But once I did, I really was able to blossom into a designer with something to say and offer something to the company, you know, that has, has led to some really interesting projects. Working on Epcot seems like a natural fit for Joe Rohde. He constructed models for the Mexico Pavilion, as well as helps guide the design process for Maelstrom in Norway. Rody can be best described as a world traveler, interested in culture and art. His interests very much help shape the two mentioned pavilions, as well as Animal Kingdom overall, as we will explore in a bit. Joe Rody has certainly worked on other projects outside of these worldly themes, as he's had a hand in Disneyland's major Fantasyland refurbishment of 1983, as well as a role in working on Captain EO, or Epcot's Imagination Pavilion. Most recently, he played an important role in retheming the Tower of Terror at Disney's California Adventure into Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout. That being said, Rody tends to have a large degree of influence in shaping projects for Disney that fit his personal philosophies. Take Disney's Alani Resort, for example. For the most part, for the most part, these artists are local artists, meaning they're from Oahu or they're from Hawaii. I would say half of them are indigenous Hawaiians, have Hawaiian ancestors, um, and their, their contributions were for the most part unedited by ourselves. You know, we wanted them to say what they wanted to say through their art um, and make this place be filled with that art that has something to say. Milani is a standalone Disney resort associated with DVC located in Hawaii where Rody grew up. Rody was able to play a large role in shaping the artistic and cultural depictions within the resort, helping to make it culturally sensitive and authentically Hawaiian. With Rody retiring, how long until Bob Chapek rethemes it to something tacky? Hopefully, DVC members prefer a more authentic and sophisticated experience. In 1989, with the opening of Pleasure Island, downtown Disney's club district, Rody was tasked with creating what had been his largest project to date, the Adventurers Club. It was a nightclub themed to, well, adventure. Nightclubs don't strike me as being Rody's style, but the theme certainly was, and once closed with the rest of Pleasure Island, inspired a Disney Parks Easter Egg theme called the Society of Explorers and Adventurers, or C for short. This in turn inspired a character, Harrison Hightower for Tokyo Disney Sea's Tower of Terror, modeled after Joe Rody himself. 
Most recently, before the announcement of his retiring, Rhodey was to be the lead on Disney's second private port for Disney Cruise Line, known as Lighthouse Point. As Rhodey worked to make sure that Ilani fit into Hawaii in a culturally sensitive way, so too was he going to guide the design process of Lighthouse Point to reflect the people and culture of the Bahamas. You can see a trend with Rhodey's influence over the Disney company. His worldly interests as a theme, as well as the need for artistry and authenticity in the portrayal of these themes, has had a huge impact on the Disney parks. Of course, this is best seen in Rhodey's largest project, Animal Kingdom. Before the immersion of Universal's Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and Disney's questionable attempt to chase down that success, Animal Kingdom was providing the most immersive experience in the world for a theme park. When you think of immersive lands at Disney, you likely think of Pandora, Toy Story Land, and Galaxy's Edge. Animal Kingdom, though, has been doing this since its inception in 1998, but people don't generally think of it from this perspective. So, why? Well, one of the criticisms of Animal Kingdom when it first opened was that it was a half-day park and there wasn't enough to do. It was just a zoo. While I certainly agree that it needed more attractions on opening, Disney seemed to feel that the park had plenty to offer if you took your time to explore the animal trails and take in the atmosphere. Labeling it a zoo was something Disney also tried very hard to stay away from. The park added attractions here and there, but with the addition of Expedition Everest in 2006 and finally Pandora in 2017, the park feels quite rounded out. The park, though, has included incredibly immersive experiences far before Disney went chasing universal success. The Port of Harambe in the Africa section of the park may not be as grand as the mountains of Pandora, but still offers incredible immersion through the way it tells its story through detail and architecture. It's meant to feel like an authentic, lived-in place that could really exist somewhere in Africa. As you work your way through the town, you can choose to take the Kilimanjaro Safari trucks through the Harambe Reserve, or step onto the Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail, a gorilla sanctuary. Kilimanjaro Safari has a simple premise. You're taking a safari into the Harambe Wildlife Preserve to view the animals. In the original iteration of the attraction, there was a storyline meant to warn guests of the dangers of poachers and featured a deceased mother elephant around this area. It was, however, removed due to guest complaints. The rest of the safari, however, has been left mostly intact. It's easy to think of this as just a truck ride with animals. You'd be doing yourself a disservice, though, if you didn't take in the expertly crafted and landscape set pieces meant to convey the Harambe Wildlife Preserve. Take, for example, the completely made of concrete baobab trees, the expertly manicured grasslands, the perilous bridge across crocodile bathing pools, and the artificially distressed clay walls showing elephants eating clay. The whole experience is a carefully crafted show of encouraging the animals into your view whether it be artificially heated rocks to guide the lions, or the hidden placement of food to see some grazers. The landscape on Kilimanjaro isn't big or flashy, but the intent of recreating an actual safari experience is just as impressive, though often sadly missed. The Gorilla Falls Exploration Trail goes for the same idea. It's meant to feel like a walk through the forest where studies of the animals are being done, it's easy for the average guest to dismiss this as just a zoo, but the details and landscaping try to make this as authentic an experience as possible. Take for example, this exhibit for the female gorillas, meant to feel more like a study. Another example is this jungle outpost, again, meant to seem as if scientists are working to study and make efforts for the conservation of the animals.
The same idea applies to the Asia section of the park. There are subtle hints, here and there, to bring the fictional country of Anandapur to life, in a village that seems very in tune living side by side with animals, like these gibbons. As you explore the Maharaja jungle track, you discover the ruins of an old palace. Here you can find an outpost where bats are being studied, tigers roaming through the ruins, and the abandoned gardens attracting colorful birds. Again, it's easy to not pay attention to the details if you're just looking for big e-ticket attractions, but Animal Kingdom is a park meant to tell its story through the environment and for you to take your time exploring it. On the notes of big e-ticket attractions, the addition of Expedition Everest to Asia expanded on the idea of what Anandapur was. It's a fictional country that seems to be inspired by India, but as you get closer to the Himalayas, it feels more Nepalese. It's kind of astounding that Animal Kingdom is trying to theme a land around a cultural mixing pot, trying to present itself as authentically as possible, despite being a theme park with a big thrilling roller coaster in sight. There's a lot more I could get into, such as Dinoland USA, which is supposed to look like the kitschy tourist trap that people often criticize it for being, or how the center of the park, Discovery Island, is some sort of fictional island of people who live in tune with the animals around them. We can also talk about the underrated oasis at the front of the park. And of course, about the ridiculously impressive Pandora. Those, however, are topics for other video essays at another time. I've spoken a lot about Animal Kingdom, but it's a park that clearly shows the hand of Joe Rohde. It's a park that expresses itself through many forms of art, whether that be the architecture, the subtle details, or the engineering that goes into both its structures and animal exhibits to feel as immersive as possible. It feels culturally authentic in the way that it tries to mimic real-world cultures respectfully. Take this clip from a TV special on Everest, for example. All of the architecture of the Tibetan Himalayas is symbolic. Every color has meaning. Some people think the black around the windows is to actually heat the wall up so that that hot air um, is drawn into the building and keeps it warm. The reason we're using red on the corners is there's a cultural significance to the red, and it's kind of a protective color. And what it is is that you want to protect the corners, protect around the openings of doorways. Why, though, was Joe Rohde allowed to take the reins on this project and give us the fantastic park that we received? In the early 1980s, after the completion of Epcot, Disney was in financial danger. As part of the company restructuring to combat this, the president of Paramount, Michael Eisner, was brought in as Disney's new CEO in 1984. Eisner, seeing a lot of potential in the Walt Disney World property, made efforts to take the products of competitors and do those the Disney way. For example, as president of Paramount, he was privy to Universal's plans to open a studio park in Orlando. To outcompete Universal, Eisner took those plans and developed Disney's MGM Studios. To compete with SeaWorld, the Living Seas Pavilion was added to Epcot. Pleasure Island was Disney's answer to Orlando's nightclubs and bars. So what major competitor was left? Busch Gardens Tampa. In designing Animal Kingdom, Eisner knew that there would be a lot of public scrutiny on Disney as to how it treated its animals. As Animal Kingdom was quite the unconventional park, Joe Rohde was chosen for the way he could create connections between real life 
and what Disney was trying to emulate. I think I've illustrated clearly enough how different Animal Kingdom is from the other Disney parks. It's not a zoo so much as it's an incredible immersive theme park that features live animals. There's creativity around every corner, from the animal carvings on the Tree of Life, to the use of real items found throughout the world made to flesh out Disney's fictional lands. My concern though, now that Rhodey has retired, is the cheapening of Animal Kingdom through the use of IP. The infusion of IP into Disney parks is a given. With Animal Kingdom though, the IP never outshines the rest of the park. It's Tough to be a Bug, a show based on Pixar's A Bug's Life, melds into the park's theme of conservation through its anti-pesticides message. Dinosaur's relationship to the 2000 film of the same name is minimal to the point of not even really being a tie-in. Disney meet and greets are a given, and Finding Nemo the Musical and Festival of the Lion King are hidden behind facades that complement the rest of the park. The same idea applies with Rafiki's Planet Watch, which is relegated to its own isolated section of the park and feels more like a science center. When Bob Iger announced that Avatar as a franchise was coming to Animal Kingdom, I thought it was absolutely insane. How could something like this ever fit into the park? But under Rhodey's leadership, I was proven wrong. With its strong message of conservation and integration into other design philosophies of the park, Pandora transcends the mediocre film that inspired it and feels almost original. It fits so organically into the park itself that it doesn't even feel like an IP to me. Compare this to Galaxy's Edge, a corporate feeling shopping mall, essentially. Recently though, there have been some transgressions. While Up is a fantastic film, its use in the new bird show feels incredibly tacky. The same applies with Donald's Dino Bash in Dino Land. I think meet and greets are an essential part of the parks, but here it's a tacky overlay that clashes with the already intentional kitsch. Recently, there have been rumors swirling around that Bob Chapek is interested in bringing Indiana Jones into a Dino Land re-theme. I don't think that this is true, but if it is, that's absolutely insane. Dinoland should be expanding on its attractions, not trying to make a quick dollar off of a half-baked re-theme. A somewhat popular trend online is to bring both the Black Panther and Zootopia franchises into the park, which again is insane. Building Wakanda has nothing to do with the park, and people cheerleading for Zootopia don't seem to understand the point of the film as its use of animal characters works as a metaphor and is only superficially related to anything that Animal Kingdom has to offer. With rumors like this swirling around Disney's creatively bankrupt leadership though, Rhodey, more than ever, feels like a guardian for the thematic integrity of the park. Without Rhodey, I'm not sure that Pandora would have worked and probably would have damaged the image of the park rather than strengthening it. Without Rhodey, the guardian of Animal Kingdom, we likely wouldn't have the special place that we have today. I understand that this video was a bit lengthy and I fully intended to include a lot more. I think there's a lot to say about how incredible other parts of the park are, and I've almost said nothing about Rafiki's Planet Watch or Kali River Rapids. I've concluded that there's just too much to unpack in just this one park, and so I will likely explore these topics in other video essays. I'm interested though, in what you have to say about the topic of this video. Has Joe Rohde allowed Animal Kingdom to flourish into the artistic masterwork it is today? Do you think there will be any drastic changes now that he's gone? If you enjoy the content of my videos, I do encourage you to leave a like, as well as to hit the subscribe button and bell notification so that you'll know when I upload new content.